So it was a hot Texas summer day, well over 100 degrees. And my friend and friend of the congregation, the Reverend Dr. Stephen Sprinkle, was out front watering his bushes. During that two-hour window that he had only once a week because Texas was in a drought, and there was a regulation, a city ordinance that said if you wanted to water your bushes or your garden or your grass, you couldn't use your irrigation system, you couldn't use a sprinkler, you had to stand out there with hose in hand and spray for the two hours that you were allowed to do so once a week. And as Steve was standing out there, the 100 degree sun of Texas beating down on him that afternoon, down the street came the sanitation workers who were picking up trash that were lining the streets of Steve's Texas neighborhood. And on this black asphalt, which was probably producing a, a heat index 20 degrees more than what the actual temperature was, two guys were running along each side of the street, taking bins and throwing it in the back of the truck, each one working a different side. And as the young man who was throwing the bins on Steve's side of the street into the back of the truck into the trash compactor came near, Steve could see that he was drenched in sweat. He was a fit, lean young man, but Steve could tell that the hours of a hard day's labor in that hot Texas sun had taken, the toll, had taken a toll on this young man. And after he took Steve's bin and threw the trash in the back of the, of the truck, he looked at Steve, holding that hose, and he said, Mister, could I get a drink of water? And Steve, ever gracious, said, just hang on one second, let me run inside, I'll get you a glass with some ice in it. And the, and the young man was like, that's okay, the hose will be fine. And Steve handed him over the hose, and this young sanitation engineer took a long pool of water from that hose, and then proceeded to douse his head and his face and his neck and his shoulders and his chest, and the water just came dripping down. Woo! He said, thank you. You are a lifesaver. And by this time, the young man's partner, who was working the other side of the street, noticed that the man had a hose in his hand and that he was drinking from it. And so he came across to the side that, that Steve was on to join his colleague. And he said, hey, can, can I get some of that? And Steve said, sure. But Steve's not holding the hose. The young man is holding the hose. And instead of handing it over to his colleague, he took his thumb and pressed it in the front of the hose's nozzle. And he just <laughs> sprayed his friend up and down and all over, and his, and his friend was like, hey, as he danced in surprise of what, what the young man had done. And they all laughed. And finally, the young man handed the hose over to his friend, and he first feigned spraying his, his friend back, but then he too took a long drink from the hose. Thanks. Thank you so much. And they handed the hose back to Steve, and they went along with the rest of their day, going down the street, throwing trash in the back of a truck, doing work that most of us would not want to do, but is essential for a thriving community and society. And when I heard Steve Sprinkle share this story with me over a plate of sushi in an air-conditioned restaurant in Texas, he finished up by saying, Ain't grace fun? G.K. Chesterton, the great British 20th century thinker, essayist, essayist, theologian, and from what I've read, all around good guy, he says, and I quote, life is serious all of the time, but living cannot be. You can, you can have all the solemnity you wish about your dress, but in the important things of life, death, faith, sex, you must have mirth, or you will have madness. Which is just a really intellectual British way of saying, have a laugh, y'all. Don't be so serious all the time. And sometimes in moments when you think tears are called for, the best medicine for the soul is just a good laugh. We know that laughter is good for the heart, for the mind, for the waistline. It eases anxiety, it lowers stress, it burns calories. 
And I'm, but I'm not sure that we Christians, particularly we progressive Christians, which take ourselves a little bit too seriously sometimes, we haven't gotten in our thick skulls that there is grace and laughter as, and fun as well as in tears and seriousness. Getting a good laugh in doesn't mean that you will miss your loved one any less. It doesn't mean that the world will still not just end in a blaze of nuclear horror. It doesn't mean that your bank account will miraculously have more in it than what you need. It does not mean that you awaiting test results won't be waiting for those test results won't be done anxiously. It does not mean that your marriage or your work relationships or your relationship with your children or neighbors will not all of a sudden become marvelous 24-7, 365 days out of the year. It does not mean that you won't worry about your aging parents, your children who won't listen to you, and so on and so forth. Because life, as Chesterton says, is serious. But in the grip of the stresses and fears and angers and... I would. I'm going to call Rich Wayman. That's funny. I don't know what I said that triggered Siri, but that's funny. That's awesome. Let's turn you off, Siri. I love it. I was going to call Rich Wayman. Usually when I have a question about life and church, it's to call Rich Wayman. Life is hard. You got that. But sometimes a little bit of grace-filled fun, like Siri miraculously, weirdly coming on, is fun. It's amazing. But you, sometimes you have to, sometimes it's not as obvious as your phone going off in the middle of services. Sometimes you have to look for the grace. It's not as easily a, as apparent as in other cases. Take, for example, today's story. For me, this story about Moses and the rock and, and God saying you're not going to go into the promised land, it fits into what I like to call the fig tree category. Because every time we get to one of these stories where it just doesn't make any sense, God or Jesus just isn't acting the way that we come to expect God and Jesus to act. And anytime we come across these stories in, in, in Bible study or, or something like that, people always bring up, like, why did Jesus have to curse the fig tree? Or why did Moses not get God to be able to go into the promised land? And my answer to every single one of these questions is, I don't know. But the God of the rainbow, the God who forgave Nineveh, the God who says through Christ on the cross, God forgive them for they know not what they do, some way, for some reason, for somehow made a punk move in not allowing Moses and Aaron to enter into the promised land. But I, and I don't know why. But what I do know is if you focus on that, that is what we like to call tree-type stuff. And if you dwell on it, then you will miss the much more important forest-type stuff. We like to get into the weeds, but let's take a step back. Because there is so much grace in this story. There is a huge, massive Amazon rainforest amount of grace in this story. And the Reverend Dr. Sharon Sparks, who is the first woman ever to be called as the senior pastor at the prestigious and historical Madison Avenue Baptist Church pulpit, who is also a writer and a comedian, has written a great little book called Laugh Your Way to Grace. And in it, Reverend Sparks implores us Christians, particularly us progressive Christians, to search for the humor and the fun in the scriptures because we take it all way too seriously. And we come to think that the only powerful services and the only right way to read a scripture verse is either it moves us to tears or it elicits that really fun, progressive Christian thing to do. Hmm. And the church needs to catch on with what biologists and psychologists and teachers and hospice nurses and doctors and corporate leaders have known for a long period of time, which is there is so much grace and laughter and fun. It snaps us out of the doldrums of our day. It can be a balm in Gilead for our sin-sick soul. So let's go over this story one more time so that you can see all the grace in it. Miriam has died. The people are hot. 
and thirsty and lost. They have been at war on numerous occasions, and this journey is getting freaking long. Their feet hurt. Their back hurts. Their heart hurts. They've complained and complained in most cases, rightfully so, by the way. But Moses and Aaron, they're bearing the burden of their responsibilities. And now the one, the only one that we know of in the scriptures who could lift people's spirits and morales through song and dance, the prophet Miriam has died. And so the third member of their triumphant is no longer there. The people that they are caring for and leading have PTSD. Let us, not, let us be very clear about this. They have PTSD from their treatment under Egypt. They have PTSD from, the, from experiencing and observing the first Passover where the firstborn dies, all of them. They have PTSD from the event at the Red Sea where thousands of soldiers lost their lives like that. They have PTSD and they're reacting to it, rightfully so. And then God commands Moses to strike the rock once, but he does it twice, and water bursts forth and people drink, but then God condemns Moses and Aaron to die on the doorsteps of a promise fulfilled. From your reaction, I'm guessing that we missed where the grace was. I mean, we all caught it, right? Reverend Sparks implores us not to confuse the gifts of life with the gifts of grace. You might be saying to yourself, well, the gift of grace was the water from the rock. No, that's a gift of life. Water, clean, drinkable water is a fundamental human right that every single living human being has a right to and, access, and should have access to. That is not a gift of grace. That is a gift of life. No, the gift of grace was all of the laughter. You heard the laughter in the story, right? What laughter? The look on your faces is looking like, what, what, what laughter? Well, you see, you got to take your little map and hit the plus button and scan and pan out a little bit and get a bigger perspective and use your imaginations to hear all the laughter. The laughter and the grace filled fun were all of the children who were playing in that water bursting from that rock. There are children on this journey, and they have just been given the opportunity to laugh and play and splash in a, an abundance of water, the scripture tells us. Splashing and playing in a 5th century BCE version of the picture that is on the front of your bulletin, which is a very famous Life magazine picture of, of, of kids playing in the streets in New York City where a fire hydrant unexpectedly burst during a heat wave in 1953. Reverend Sparks reminds us in her book, laughter has an infectious quality. We can feel less stressed just thinking about laughing and hearing other people laugh. Laughter reduces stress, sets the tone, impacts people's disposition. We can say that if we didn't laugh, we would cry, but that's really not what the point is, because laughter and crying are both twin gifts from our living and loving and gracious God. We must embrace a faith that trusts that God may have given people a means to help deal with the stressful and tension and trying times and circumstances of their lives in a, the simple yet profound and amazing remedy of laughter. How much was the laughter of those children playing in the water, bursting from the rock, grace for all of the people there? For a moment, the heat broke. For a moment, they were brought into the present and they no longer had the future anxieties of an army invading or predators attacking. For a moment, they could rest and play and soak and bathe. You can just imagine the people going underneath the rock and, sa and singing, I'm going to wash that exodus right out of my hair. <laughs> and what grace for Aaron and Moses. How much did hearing the laughter of those children soothe the grief over the loss of their beloved sister Miriam. For a moment, they could relax and have the lift of the weight of their responsibilities taken off their slumped shoulders 
and they too, can't you just imagine Aaron pushing Moses and the water running over his big old afro and, and beard? How much did that grace save their lives? Let me end with this. Sometimes we just take ourselves too seriously, particularly here in the church, particularly during Holy Week. This past March, we were on the point at Pioneer Ocean View, celebrating Monday Thursday. That's the service where we commemorate Jesus watch, washing the disciples' feet and commemorating the Last Supper, and we prepare for the darkness of Good Friday. As the sun sets, we start to walk into the shadows. It's a serious service, y'all. It's a solemn service. And people like to take it real seriously. But there was one little boy who just really loved the communion bread. We used this communion bread at Pioneer Ocean View, which to me tasted like Pringles. <laughs> and when we were done, and the excess, bo uh, bo uh, of excess baskets of communion bread were put on the altar table, and we were about to go into to, to reading about how the sun was going down and Jesus was praying in Gethsemane and being arrested and tortured and crucified, this little boy just found every way to like evade every adult that he possibly could to make his way up to the communion table as we're reading about Jesus being crucified, eating the bread from the table. <laughs> as I'm watching this, I cannot help myself but start to grin, and I had to suppress a huge laughter because it's not cool to have like, and then they took him and whipped him. Ha, 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 ha. There were certain people in the congregation who did not find the humor in it, like I did. And I just wanted to say to them, have some fun, y'all. Have a laugh. There's grace happening right in front of you, and you're shutting it out, being a Scrooge. On my sabbatical, I was at a party and on the party table, there was a basket of chips and some guacamole. And I took one of those chips, and I dipped it in that guacamole, and I ate it. And I thought to myself, I tasted this before. Where have I tasted it? Oh my God, this is the body of Christ. <laughs> Not everybody at the party understood. But I asked the host, Where'd you get your body of Christ? <laughs> and he gave me a, he let me take a picture of the package. And last week I bumped into the mom of the little boy. And I said, now your boy can eat all the body of Christ he wants. <laughs> In the midst of the desert and the tensions and the stress of life, God gifts us with some grace-filled fun if we'll just accept it. Even in the midst of Good Fridays, I heard and I learned this week that the gifts of Easter are a blessing for us all. Not three days after Good Friday, but while our Good Fridays are occurring. If we'll just accept it. So let us, I don't know what your sense of humor is. We all got a different sense of humor. But I encourage you to do what you need to do to find a way to live into that grace-filled fun of God this day. For it is amazing, and truly, it's a lifesaver. Amen?